And this is very much, this is not only, you know, in our lifetimes. This is, you know, practically since we all went to the bathroom last. Um, social media has become diplomacy's significant other. No country across the world practically is not online and using media. So the topic, obviously, uh, what you've been led to believe, both from my slide and from the, uh, the flyer that you got, is media and foreign policy. But I'm going to not spend my entire time talking about media and foreign policy, because I want to sort of insert you into kind of a media mindset. And I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes uh, sort of in the media sphere, which is how do we understand the world, and not just how do we understand the world when we open um, the Boston Globe, which, by the way, has a story about Yale on the front page today, just saying. Um, but, uh, but how do we process our own lives and those of our families? So I'm going to start off with a couple of little, let's call them exercises, and, and then I'm going to have a hate to say this, but sort of a once over lightly um, of some of the issues that I raised in the chapter that I, um, that I wrote for the Great Decisions book, and that those of you who um, at least are aware of the fact that there is a um, public television documentary that um, relates to that, that I also consulted on and was interviewed for, along with a lot of other far, far more famous people. Um, both are very much worth um, reading or looking at. So, here we go. So I'm going to call on you, and I'm going to treat you guys like my own class, all right? Which means that if you're on an aisle and wearing a bright piece of clothing, you're likely to get called on. So, you know, um, just bear that in mind. So what do you see in this person's face? And there's a woman with an orange shirt on. That is you, yes. So what do you see in this man's face? OK, a grifter. Now, let me, put, let me ask you it in this terms. Pretend you are a staffer for the president. All right? Many of you, that's maybe a real pretend for you, but pretend you're a staffer for the president. Do you like this photograph? Is this a photograph that you think puts your candidate in a positive light? No. Yes. yes. Some of you, OK, so why yes? He looks very serious. Looks for, OK, so serious. If I'm the staffer. Right, exactly. So whether or not you voted for the president, I'm asking you to pretend that you are on his staff. You had your hand up as well. I say he looks determined. Determined. OK, so we have determined, we have serious. Any other inputs? Uh-huh. His intensity. OK, so maybe anger. All right, yes? Challenging, he's challenging you. He's challenging you, right. He's looking right at you. It's a very intent glare. Let me go to another photograph here. OK, what about this face? You are still the staffer. Do you like it? No. You don't like it. Not a positive photograph. Why don't you? Why don't you like this? You're the staffer. Yes? Smug. He looks smug. Smug? He looks sarcastic. Sarcastic. Looks spacey. spacey. I'm hearing. He looks like he's saying, I can't believe I got this job. I can't believe I got this job. <laughs> I'm, I'm really not hearing anybody see anything positive here. Yeah. Friendly. Friendly. In the back. He looks sure of himself. Sure of himself. OK, confident. All right. So if you were, um, if you were the president, would you use this photograph in your publicity? It's actually the home page of the White House. I just cropped it. And the first photograph you saw, that was one of his main photographs from the campaign. He actually had a rule during the campaign to never be shown smiling, and the reason was he was channeling. 
Winston Churchill. So much so that actually he brought a bust of Winston Churchill into the Oval Office. All right, so the stories that we tell, my guess is if I was giving this lecture to the American Enterprise Institute, for example, I might have had slightly different, but not entirely different reactions. So we are, we are all creatures of our, our background, our history, our politics, um, our geographies, and so forth. All right, so one more exercise, and then we're going to move into more content, shall we say. All right, so you guys have phones? Yeah. Get your phones out. All right, unlock it. Everybody done? OK, you don't actually have to hand it over to the person next to you, because already I saw, I think there were some husbands and wives looking at each other like, oh, I'm not sure. You know? So what's the issue here that had you go, Ugh. right? It's maybe a number of things, but at the base, it's an issue of trust, right? So when you're thinking about your, your own smartphone and so forth, you're thinking about what do you own, what do you have, um, you know, within your own control, and then how do you want to engage with other people? And we think that we pick our opportunities to doing that. Now, I'm going to walk you through a very quick case study, um, which is a question about how do you engineer trust? It's a really important issue. I don't know if any of you have threads to Silicon Valley, but I picked one example, which is Airbnb. I'm guessing many of you are familiar with it. It is the, um, the web platform that allows you to either rent your English basement or your second bedroom or alternatively stay in somebody else's uh, rather than in the more expensive, presumably, hotel um, down the street. Now, when Airbnb posed the notion of Airbnb to the venture capitalists, they said, yeah, right. Like, people are really going to want to spend time in your home when they don't even know you, or you want to open your home to people who you don't even know. The issue was about trust. So Airbnb had to figure out how it could engineer trust, how it could get people to want to rent, and how it could get people to want to be renters, even if it was just for a night or a week or however long. All right. So they did a number of different kinds of things. One, of course, was creating a lovely website. One was when you rent or when you are a renter, you have to put your photograph up and it has to get verified. All right. So you also have to have an exchange back and forth. And they engineer it so you can't share too much because it turns out from focus groups that you can overshare. And people really don't. That, turns a lot of people off. Now, you also can review, and that's a principle that many of you may be familiar with from whether it's Amazon or eBay. There's a lot of sites now that rely on reviews and feedback um, in order to help engineer trust. Needless to say, you want to see photos of the place. You get a map of the location, and you can dive in because it's clicked into Google. And then there's a form to report complaints directly there. It all seems very transparent. And so that's how one Silicon Valley company gets you to stay in somebody's house. Right. Now, this is a company, as you can see here on the slide, that has upended industry upon industry upon industry. Right. And they found various ways to get you um, to essentially open your phone, pass that phone on to a stranger. Because that's essentially what you're doing. You have given Airbnb your most personal information, including photos. Now, a lot of people actually, interestingly enough, don't want to put their own photos. And there is a bit of a Reddit on this phenomenon, which is people often put photos of their children. Um, 
which if you were to do that on Facebook might raise other issues. But anyway, all right. So if you're thinking about it, that's maybe a trade-off you want to make. You want to make it for Airbnb. You're happy to give Amazon as well access. Um, but now here we're getting to foreign policy. How do you feel about sharing your information with Russia, with troll farms in Moscow or Macedonia? How do you feel about giving the information to Cambridge Analytica, um, which is, of course, not from this Cambridge, but is a UK uh, operation? Now, in the world of technology, there's typically two reasons, and I'm grossly simplifying here, but there's typically two reasons uh, that people play with data. One is because they want to make money. It's the business model. Facebook comes to mind here. The other is they want power, and that's the political model. That's political campaigns, um, whether it's for uh, an election or whether it's for a Brexit, for example. So um, you are giving your data as a trade-off to use a Facebook platform, to use um, Uber or Lyft or whatever. Every time you use it, I've used Uber three times today. I am essentially, as it says here, I'm filling out a questionnaire about myself, where I am, where I'm going, um, uh, and that can be coordinated with, oh, who my friends are. I didn't go to a hotel. I went to a friend's house. Well, all of a sudden, they know some information about who my friends might be, and they can coordinate that with other data, and they can see what she does. Um, they can see how old she is. They can see how many children she has. They can make assumptions about both of us, so on and so forth. All right. So companies are buying that data because your data is for sale. That's the business model for so many organizations. Before the 2016 election, as it says here, Cambridge Analytica, this uh, firm, which, by the way, got its name because they thought Cambridge was sort of a trustworthy sounding name. Um, literally, because uh, they bought all these data points. And when I say every adult in the United States, I'm basically meaning almost every adult in the United States. And that asterisk thing in the bottom, that's just some of the information uh, that they could get on you. Now, what they could do with all that data from Facebook and then from voter rolls and so forth and so on is they could not only say that you are so-and-so who lives in such and such address who went to such and such a school and has these children, but they could say, um, and you tend to buy things at 11 o'clock at night, and you buy an awful lot of chocolate ice cream. Um, matter of fact, you buy so much chocolate ice cream, we think you might be depressed. Uh, or you're buying uh, a really huge black bag with lots of pockets. Are you pregnant? Literally, Target, for example, can tell by five things whether you're pregnant or not with a 90-some-odd percent accuracy rate. So data not, is some, not only is something that we're giving to other people, it's a way of finding us. Now, what this is called in the field is micro-targeting. And what Cambridge Analytica is able to do is not just find a political profile of you, but create a psychological profile of you. And with that psychological profile of you, they know your buttons. They know that you don't tend to go to the gym on a rainy day. Um, they know that you, know, you don't work on Monday afternoons, uh, that you're doing something else online. All right. So with that kind of information being fed to Republicans, because that's who Cambridge Analytica was supporting in the 2016 election, first, as you probably know, Ted Cruz, and then they switched to Trump, um, that they were able to give the, uh, many of the Republican candidates a huge leg up on uh, sort of media buys. So you had the Democrats, such as Hillary Clinton, spending a lot of money on buying ads while Trump was using uh, 
was using uh, social media to get his message out. And there was a lot of conversation like, why is he going where he's going? Why isn't he going to some of the, the swing states and so forth? He was going to places that were targeted, as it says here, by the density of persuadable voters. And they knew that because of the psychological profiles they had run on voters into um, not just by congressional districts, but literally by streets. Um, so what else did they do? They helped the Trump campaign target ads. Now, some of you may know about A-B testing. A-B testing is used a lot. It's used in the news industry. Boston Globe does it. It's used in retail. Um, basically, what you do is often very early in the morning, you would put out, if you have Boston Globe, you'd put out your breaking news story, and you'd put two different headlines on it. And you'd see how many people clicked on which headline, and then whichever one was more successful, uh, that would be the headline that you would go with. So there's this window, usually very early in the morning on news, for example, that's the A-B testing of headlines. All right? Well, it turns out there's A-B testing, as you might expect, for um, uh, messaging of all kinds, including political messaging. Um, it's called dark posts. Uh, and what you see in the bottom is the page on Facebook where if you're a business user of Facebook, you can go and create a dark post. But basically, a dark post means that um, I'm going to assume the two of you gentlemen sitting here are friends, but you may have different interests. So it might mean that you, going onto your Facebook, would see a different ad for the exact same candidate or for the exact same place as your friend next to you would do. Now let me show you just one slide of how that plays out. Um, so this is a screen grab from a YouTube video um, from Cambridge Analytica, which I checked last night, is still up online. Um, and basically, the, uh, one of the, the heads of Cambridge Analytica was showing his audience how the messaging went on guns. So if you were a woman who they categorized in their psychological profile as high neuroticism conscientious, you would see ads that talked ab about a fear factor. The way to get you to support guns in the Second Amendment would be to say it's going to protect you and your family. Whereas this guy, who is closed and agreeable, that's his psychological profile, is getting the sort of the heritage, father to son, you know, this is the founding fathers, we are the inheritors of this. He's not getting the ones about, hey, somebody scary could break into your house. He's getting a very different kind of messaging on the very same topic. All right, media. So we've been talking a little bit now here at the top about um, social media and data and bringing Cambridge Analytica in. I've for the most part talking about the um, US environment, but of course, with the intercession of a British firm. So I want to just for a moment remind us all, and here we are in the, you know, the city of how many universities. Uh, so maybe this is not an audience that needs reminding, but the founding fathers, and perhaps a few founding mothers as well, thought essential for democracy were free speech and free press. And of course, in uh, the First Amendment, they're folded in with three other rights, religion, assembly, and um, petition. Uh, and you probably have heard this um, quote from George Washington, which predates by some bit. It's actually still at the end of the American Revolution. It was in an address to his officers talking about the value of, of free speech. And uh, back in 2013, so pre this election, Donald Trump actually tweeted out um, that same quote. Now, one of the things that when I was in the history department at Harvard, I took courses with someone, some of you who are American historians may know Bernard Balin, one of the great American um, historians. Uh, and he would talk.
talk about a genre of history that grew up that talked about American exceptionalism. America as that city on a hill. And if that has any value anymore, and it would be an interesting debating point, I think it does as an idea personally, I would argue, this is a quote from me, uh, more or less, that it's our free speech and free press tradition. Because if you look at all the constitutions that have been generated since the American Constitution, this is what they've adopted from us. This is our probably our most successful foreign policy export ever. Free speech and free press. So, free press. Let's go back to that since we're talking for this purpose is more about free press than others. Giving people information they need to act in their lives, whatever actions they need to take. So let's, let's add the foreign policy component to this. But I'm going to start by saying that very often, the media is not per se covering foreign policy. And I write actually an awful lot about the fact that it's very hard to say that even the most prominent op-ed or front page Pulitzer Prize winning news story actually changed foreign policy. What we can say is media covers foreign news, and I was looking this week to see what are some of the main stories, and needless to say, the new royal baby, one of the happy stories out there, um, this is from the Times video. But this is literally the first time ever that a potential heir to the throne has been announced on Twitter. The very first breaking news story came out on Twitter. All right? George and Charlotte were not announced that way. Um, and if you go into Twitter, some of you might be on Twitter, you can see, you could click on that previous where it said show thread, and you can see. So Kensington Palace, which is the official Twitter feed for the, um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge? No, Duke and Duchess of Cornwall. What is Cornwall? Cambridge. I thought, no, that's too much of a coincidence. Um, they're also for Prince Harry. Anyway, so they have another one there. If you can't read it, the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall, Prince Harry, and the members of both families have been informed and are delighted with the deuce. And then you have St. George's CE, which is actually the preschool where um, George goes. How great to have a royal baby on St. George's Day, congratulations. And then somebody picks up and says, and Shakespeare's birthday, and then some other wag, um, but I cut it off. It's also Shakespeare's born on the same day, and he died on the same day, so it's also his death day. <laughs> yeah, but you know, less happy. Anyway, this is the homepage of the Kensington Palace, right? So this is the kind of coverage of the news a lot of the time. It's news. Sometimes it's upbeat. A lot of times it's not. But it's news. It's not policy. But what we're increasingly seeing, and this is very much, this is not only you know, in our lifetimes. This is you know, practically since we all went to the bathroom last. Um, social media has become diplomacy's significant other. No country across the world, practically, is not online and using media. 178 countries, and this was from last year. Um, this is a, a Bursa Marsteller's 2017 study. Have a Twitter feed, right? Their foreign minister, their president, their prime minister, State Department, whatever it is, Department of the Interior, they all have Twitter and Facebook accounts. All right. Now, some of you may remember this moment, uh, several press secretaries back, Sean Spicer, uh, in the opening days of the Trump administration, was asked about uh, how the press and 
the American public and for that matter the world should understand the tweets coming not from the White House official um, Twitter account which had been passed on from President Obama to President Trump but how it should consider it and it said and Spicer said these are official statements the, the president is speaking and in as much as the president we need to consider these as official statements so now let me move to very much the present day this week um, I try to keep things very update so this was a tweet from um, this past weekend April 20th and Trump talking about the President Trump talking about North Korea. And I'll give you a second to read it. All right. So what he was responding to, and I'm not going to take the time to, uh, to run it, but it was a very short announcement by the North Koreans, and it was subtitled, this uh, screen grabs from the BBC, North Korea will stop nuclear tests, and launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles starting from that next day to guarantee suspension of nuclear tests in a transparent manner the republic's northern nuclear test site will be abolished all right so we have this coming out from north korea a tv uh, clip that then went viral around the world every media outlet practically in the world covered it you have trump tweeting it out, and then you have our mainstream media. Right, so this is NBC, and that's um, uh, Chris Todd um, responding to it. And what you have here is it's a tweet that's, um, and then what it's saying essentially there is, yeah, this is all very well and good, but uh, they still have all these prisoners, including some Americans, and um, uh, we don't have a pledge of denuclearization. All right, they're not saying they're going to denuclearize; they're just saying they're going to put things on hold. All right. Now you have. I'm sorry, not Chris Todd, Chuck Todd. Um, now you have. A tweet from the president responding to Chuck T Todd's um, comment on TV. Now, the point to note here is, wow, we haven't given up anything, and they have agreed to denuclearization, paren, so great for world, site closure, and no more testing. So I was really, so this was literally developing in real time as I was putting together this talk. And I thought, what does it say? Five minutes. Five minutes. I'm clearly going to have to cut out some Ish. of this stuff. Ish. Well, Ish. Ish. That's all right. That's all right. I'm perfectly capable of dumping half of my talk. Um, it was brilliant, but you know. Um, was, was um, so how did our media report on this? And I thought, well, you know, NBC, MSNBC, they're pretty liberal. I'm pretty sure they're going to be, you know, they're not going to be supportive of it. Let me go look at what Fox is saying. So I went into Fox. They report that Trump attacks Todd. And then I went to CBS. Just look at the headlines. And then I went to Breitbart. And then I went to PolitiFact, Pulitzer Prize-winning fact-checking site. All right. Now, what this interchange shows is what we already know, those of us who are in Washington and watch media, which is this presidency, but it's not just this presidency, it's this moment in social media, right? Uh, if you figure that Twitter only started in 2007, we can't go back too many presidents and still have the social media landscape. So this social media, um, that we are covering the White House, journalists are covering the White House radically different than they did before. 
in part because of the attacks, but also in part because of the landscape. And here's just two examples of this. Some of you may have seen multiple stories on this. This is an early tweet um, back from 2016, shortly after the election. And then um, some of you may know the Washington Post has an app that you can add to Twitter that will fact check tweets from the president. Um, and so they're saying, no, actually, this is false. Uh, no, that's actually not what happened. Now, more recently, this was um, responding, the New York Times responding to a tweet just this week um, following the Pulitzer Prizes where Trump was attacking one of the premier political reporters on the Times staff, um, um, Maggie Haberman, and they were critiquing not only his misspelling of her name, but also what he said about her. By the way, Trump took down the entire thread. It was a thread of three tweets, took down the entire thread, and reposted it with her name corrected. All right. Um, I have a lot more to go, but I'm going to stop, because you probably have questions, and maybe that's the way to end, um, end this, because I'm happy to um, launch out from where I've left you guys um, to talk more specifically. Uh, what you're missing is a, a bit of uh, things about specifically about Facebook and some other, some other kinds of, of media um, and some other kinds of policy relating to Russia and hacking. But I'll stop there and um, take questions. And I think Mary may act as um, a little bit of a moderator. So a lot of the uh, coverage of the last campaign has focused on the psychographics used by the Russians um, and some of the hacking, of course. But you mentioned the psychographics and the very uh, the micro targeting. I'm assuming that's going to continue in the future. It's not illegal. Um, and where do you see the future of that type of attack or that type of strategy by campaigns, both national and or local? So you're right. It, it's very much continuing, and it's continuing. Um, and and actually, there are court cases and so forth being brought up about it, both in. Um, in the UK and here in the United States. I, I think one of the issues, as I think you are alluding to, is that it's really an unstoppable process. Uh, the, the audience, us, the public, are um, voluntarily engaging uh, with news outlets, with retail outlets, with social media outlets, and as a result of that, um, getting information which then can be used for other purposes by other actors um, as that data is sold. Uh, for me, the future is twofold. Uh, it's sort of what I think is going to continue happening and then what I think we can do about it. So what I think is con going to continue happening is more of the same and probably even um, better targeting, uh, which may mean worse targeting. Uh, what I think can happen on the other side is two things. One is a call from uh, those of us, uh, such as people like you in the room, calling for more transparency about what's happening, uh, that maybe you are willing to make the, uh, the trade-off for free Facebook. You're willing to give that kind of information to them. But you want to know who they're selling it to. You want to know who is going to be able to have access to that information. So, so transparency, I think, is going to be increasingly the coin of the realm. The other thing, and this is uh, one of the main hats that I wear as a, both a consultant and as a teacher, is in the world of media literacy. I think for, for practically from infancy up to um, you know, the end of time, we all need to be more th thoughtful and more aware of, of uh, what we're consuming. And I think we also need to have um, better views into what other people are consuming. I'll just give you one quick um, pitch for something. Uh, next time you're on uh, a website, put into the Google search 
uh, red feed, blue feed, or maybe it's blue feed, red feed, either way. It will pull up a, um, a free website uh, from the Wall Street Journal that will um, show you two different Facebook feeds, one for conservatives and one for liberals. And you'll see some of the different kinds of stories and the different frames of the stories. Um, so it's a really interesting uh, sort of mind check, I think, for all of us uh, to see. And, and that's part of, I think, being media literate. So um, given what we already knew about sort of granular social media advertising and the use of data in uh, campaigns like Obama's, for example, why is sort of all this Cambridge Analytica so surprising to so many people? Well, I suspect very few people actually fact check it. I wonder if there's any data on the effectiveness of fake news. Okay. Um, th those are probably somewhat related. So the, but I'll take the second one first. So, I mean, there is a fair, one of the things about social media is, uh, or for that matter about even mainstream media as it presents on social media's websites or on its own websites is uh, that they know where you came from, they know how long you've been on a single page, they know what you're clicking on, they know where you're going and so forth. So. Um, there is a lot of data, BuzzFeed actually, um, last fall, November, I think, um, did a really interesting, it was actually post, I'm sorry, it was like a while ago, actually did a really interesting uh, survey of how successful was fake news, and basically showing that the most shared, um, the most viewed stories uh, were those that were fake. Um, including ones such as the, the, one, of the, one of the most prominent that was shared was um, the Pope endorsing Trump, which of course he did not do. Um, so, uh, there is a possibility of doing fact checking and so forth in real time, um, but it rarely happens because that, because news institutions and Academic institutions are, for the most part, underfunded for what they actually um, should be doing. Um, uh, so, you know, support your local uh, NPR station. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that would be, that is coming is the ability to do more of that and to have, for example, like the, word, the Washington Post, somebody tweets and then, you know, in very short order, you get a correction of it or a heads up, think about this. Um, in terms of the Cambridge Analytica question, um, I think what, I think there's, there was a group of political elites who, who knew that that was possible. Um, as, and as you said, um, that even back in 2008, you know, it was Obama's brilliant team who was able to uh, help engineer his rise um, and success. Uh, but I don't think it had filtered down to uh, a lot of people outside in Washington, we say outside the Beltway. Um, and, you know, I would include sort of a Boston community in that sort of, of political elites. So I, I think where you're really seeing some of the, um, some of the heads up is where it made a difference um, nationally, but also where it made a difference um, for, local, um, for local elections. And I think that came as sort of a shock to people. It's, there's a longer story, but. Could you comment on one of the most successful pieces of fake news, which is still has a um, life to this day? That is the allegation that Trump ridiculed made fun of a disabled reporter. We now know that's been debunked over and over again, and yet we have the New York Slimes and other outlets repeat this over and over again that he did so. I wanted to, uh, you to comment on the use of audio, uh, and audio and video, fake audio with video. Uh, uh, there was something going on on Twitter a few days ago, I think it was Obama, and he was supposed to be 
vote, uh, articulating something, but it really wasn't him articulating it. So being able to man, uh, manipul uh, manipulate uh, the voice as being the next stage in this um, fake news scenario. Yeah, no, I, I think you raise a really interesting point, which is fake news is, is, is not just, you know, sort of onion style, invented out of whole cloth types of stories, you know, like the Pope endorsing Trump. Increasingly, it's real images with perhaps fake audio, or it's real images, and you see this a lot actually in the international realm, it's, um, or even during disasters, it's, it's real images from a hurricane, but not from this hurricane. It's real images from Syria, but not from this year. Um, and, and so it becomes a lot harder to fact check both for news audiences, but also a lot harder to, to fact check for your everyday consumer who, um, who maybe just be seeing it. So it's a real heads up, I think. Uh, so it's, thank you for pointing that out. Um, in terms of the, um, the disability um, tape, um, I know some of the people who were in the room, and I, I'm afraid, sir, that I would contest your understanding of the situation. So um, I think there were a couple of other questions. So you started out describing how Airbnb had to build trust. Has work been done on how media outlets develop trust? Do consumers just trust where outlets that echo their personal views? Or do they even care these days about whether they can really trust the source? You know, at first when this came out, I was uh, excited from a marketing point of view, having been a marketer, about being able to target you know people more effectively. But uh, this past weekend, there was a TV program that indicated what's happening in China, how they're profiling just about everybody and what they're doing, and then the government making is making decisions about who can fly and who can't fly and who might be a risk to the government because of that. That scares me. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, let, let me um, take that one first, and then I'll come back to the trust. I'll end with a trust question. So yeah, there's some terrifying uses of, um, of social, of, of facial recognition, for example, and the Chinese really are sort of the global leader um, using face recognition. Um, some of it, you might argue, is for the good. They've caught you know, long-term um, you know, criminals who've been on the lam for a long time by facial recognition, um, but it's, it's very, very troubling um, on, on human rights grounds and, and, and privacy grounds. Um, and it, one of the things that we're seeing is this, uh, the power of author author authoritarian governments and authoritarian leaders um, and the power that they have that they didn't used to have. Um, and it's, um, yeah. Uh, Trust. Um, I don't know if any of you, the name Errol Morris means anything to you, but Errol Morris is a documentary filmmaker, um, and he had a, uh, a great column in the New York Times not too long ago, a couple years, maybe a year ago, so ago, about what is the most trustworthy font. It turns out to be Baskerville. Uh, that if you want someone to believe what you're saying, put it in Baskerville. So I have all my students now writing their resumes in Baskerville. Um, uh, so yes, news outlets, uh, I think, are a little later to the table than some of the um, more heavily funded, you know, perhaps VC funded startups uh, in Silicon Valley to some extent, but are very much thinking about uh, how to engender trust. And some of it is at the level that we might consider frivolous, like use Baskerville. Um, or a serif typeface. Some of it is, is much more significant, which is, uh, I started out by talking in answer to a question about transparency, about how do they build in transparency? And one of that is by having more engagement between their reporters and, um, and their audiences, um, by putting some of their notes, uh, reporters' notes online when appropriate. Um, by having a lot more internal hot links into stories. 
It used to be, back in the day, meaning like five years ago, that if you went to the New York Times, they would never hot link out outside the New York Times. Literally, they wouldn't, right? Now, you expect that in any news story, as you're reading a news story, that you're going to hot link out to not only other news outlets, but of course, to a lot of other sites as a way for you to um, uh, you know, not only confirm what they're saying, but read beyond what they're saying. So I think that there's this notion um, within the news that it is very important for their, um, the news consumers, as it were, the public, um, to believe what they're saying. Uh, I think there are definitely some news outlets which are ahead um, in that process. I would probably put um, something like The Times and The Guardian, um, The Economist, probably, you know, um, towards the front of that. Um, but thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate it.